All right, well, well, good evening uh, once again. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Scott Korb. I'm the director of the Pacific University MFA in Writing Program with offices in Portland, Oregon, land of the Chinookan tribes who live near the intersection of the Willamette and Columbia Rivers. Today, their descendants are part of the Confederated, tri Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde, the Yakima Nation, and other tribal nations. I'm so happy uh, to be gathering us together tonight for a conversation between MFA graduate and my friend Michael Hahn and the writer Chang Ray Lee. I've long taught Chang Ray's work in my writing classes, especially his writing about family and food, including a master class in the one page essay called Sea Urchin, published in the New Yorker in 2002. It's one of my uh, very favorite essays to teach. And his fiction we'll learn tonight was the subject of Michael's critical essay for, his pro uh, for the program here at Pacific. The Mapmakers Alumni Institute, um, as you'll tell from the program I'm about to share in the chat right now, The Mapmakers Alumni Institute um, has been part of our MFA programming since the spring of 2021. What we offer through this institute is outreach both into and beyond our MFA community. Public engagement on topics that take up our time as a writing community centered on craft and the creation of art. We also see this programming as a way to provide ongoing support beyond the length of a, of a degree to those writers who've entered the program with the support of the Kwame Dawes Mapmaker Scholarship awarded to exceptional writers of color. I'll turn the floor and discussion over to Michael now um, after this brief introduction of Michael Hahn. Michael Hahn writes essays, criticism, and short fiction with works featured in Waterstone Review, Colorado Review, Phoebe, Tiferet Journal, and the Los Angeles Review Online. He is experienced in academia as a teacher, a researcher, diversity educator, and copy editor. Michael currently resides in the Washington DC area. And I'm honored uh, to know Michael and to have had the chance to work alongside him. And of course, last fall at Pacific, our home institution, where together we taught several of Chang Ray's essays, including the one I just mentioned about sea urchins. So Michael, um, thank you for gathering us here tonight. And I turn the floor over to you. Thank you, Scott. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to our discussion presented by the Mapmakers Alumni Institute. As Scott mentioned, my name is Michael Hahn, and I'm honored to be your host for the next hour with author Chang Ray Lee. Now, tonight's discussion is billed as mooted texts, affects, and the minority experience, but the topic will be more of a, an icebreaker, a touchstone, if you will, for the sake of a wide-ranging interview with our guest. So you might be asking, why affect? Well, one definition of affect is a conscious emotion that occurs in reaction to a thought or experience. All right, easy enough, feelings. Of course, as writers, we want our work to affect readers. We want them to feel the anger, sadness, and joy, and the humor that we want to write. But affect gets a little deeper. It gets into the unconscious, the systemic forces that move us, and the more inarticulable feelings uh, that are so hard to explain. Consider anxiety or shame, such negative affects that are especially felt by those who are marginalized, whether by race, class, gender, or sexuality. What's it like to always be mislabeled and not know it? To have people doubt your experience of being invisible and disenfranchised without knowing why? What does it feel like to be, quote, psychically stuck, end quote, to use the words of Anne Enlin Cheng, author of The Mel Melancholy of Race? And how do we write about it? These feelings were apparent in my reading of Chang Rae Lee's novels, many of which focus on the Korean American experience. But that's only a small part of why he's here tonight, as we'll also talk about his career as a writer and as an educator, and ask him whatever crosses our minds in the Q&A at the end. So if, if you have anything to ask, please drop a question or a comment in the chat or in the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And so it's my honor to introduce our guest, an award-winning author of six books, including 1995's Native Speaker, which won the Penn Hemingway Award, and his 2010 novel, The Surrendered, which was nominated for the Pulitzer Prize. His most recent novel, My Year Abroad, was released by Riverhead Books in 2021. And that same year, he was recognized for a Lifetime Achievement Award by the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, of which he was elected a member. Oh, and he also writes the occasional essays uh, for The New Yorker. Friends, please join me in welcoming Chang Ray Lee. Um, Chang Ray, you are on mute, just FYI. 
Sorry about that. I'm terrible with this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, Chang, nice to meet you, you, Michael. Nice to meet you. And thank you for being here. It means a lot to me that you are here. Um, you've been a wanted man by Pacific for quite some time. And so we're so glad you can join. <laughs> well, you know, I uh, did my MFA at the, down the road in Eugene at the University of Oregon. So, uh, and I always thought uh, I liked Eugene, but, um, you know, maybe... Uh, if the program had been in Portland, I would have probably stayed a little longer. <laughs> There's a, lot, a little bit more to do. We're glad you're here tonight. Um, well, look, before we get into the program, we'd love it if you could read an excerpt from one of your books, if you don't mind. Oh, yeah, yeah. You um, Well, you suggested this. Uh, this uh, it's about three, three or four pages, if, if that's okay. Excellent. Yeah. Um, it's... Uh, uh, an excerpt from My Year Abroad, and um, the, the narrator, Tiller Bardman, is talking about his mother. I wasn't old enough to understand, although I wasn't old enough to understand, I instinctively knew my mother wasn't perfectly well herself. She didn't get infirm the way some people can be when they're not particularly happy, like battling chronic headaches or backaches or suffering digestive problems or being so drained of energy that she had to retreat to bed for a few hours. If anything, my mother was fit and healthy and usually on the move, either meeting a friend in town for a coffee or doing the grocery shopping or cleaning the bathrooms or running to the college's sta stadium and doing the steps of the entire visitor's section up and down and up and down, which I watched her do whenever she took me after pickup from preschool. You could say that she was maybe too much on the move, roping a bit manically from this to that, while Clark, uh, her husband and Tiller's father, grew moss at his back office or in his favorite recliner in the family room where he read biographies or watched cable news. Even when she was playing her record, she pulled down a couple dozen and spread them out on the floor in a messy but kind of cool collage and then restacked them in the order they went on, the record changer, six at a time, which she'd re-sleeve after playing and shelved back in their appropriate alphabetical slots, humming to the next tunes while going about her chores and to-dos. Because we mostly avoid such things, I've never talked seriously with Clark about what exactly her deal was, but I think we both know how in her own subtle way she grasped, ev grasped everything too tightly, without pause, until the minute and hour and day she couldn't anymore and had to let go. I remember once when Clark had an especially severe attack of vertigo and had to stay in bed for nearly a week with an eye shade on. He'll still get one every so often when he's feeling particularly tired or stressed. And she had to explain to me what it was. Everybody has a natural sense of balance and your daddy's has temporarily gone haywire. He doesn't know what's up or down or sideways. That's why he can't stand up. I asked if it would happen to me next. I doubt it, she said, you're just a little boy. Will it happen to you? She didn't answer immediately, but then emptily smiled and shook her head, which heartened me because I was afraid she'd end up next to him and I'd be on my own. But picturing that absent expression now, I know she was fighting off a different kind of vertigo. This disturbance rooted far deeper than in the inner ear. It was subtle how she managed. She was much like any other young mother, but I can see now, if not understanding it then, how those constant movements and activities were her way of dealing with the shadows that were creeping up on her. One day when I was in kindergarten, we got together with a play group of other mom and kid pairs at a neighbor's house, the moms in the kitchen having rosé and potato chips, we kids in the backyard collecting dirt and branches and rocks for some undoubtedly critical project. The backyard was fenced and abutted the heavily wooded 300 acre campus of a world famous scientific institute all sorts of painfully nerdy looking people, mostly younger men with bad haircuts and spectacles could be seen strolling through the neighborhood with their heads down or with slightly skewed grins of genius. But you could get through the fence via swinging door and the resident kids suggested we look for our treasures farther afield and off we trooped along a path and then down other branching ones and then ventured off trail to find some deer clearing and then bushwhacked to another and another until we realized we were lost which made us panic and get more lost. It was high summer time, so it wasn't getting dark anytime soon, but the woods were jungly with weed trees and brambly with blackberry bushes, and we could hardly move and kind of stalled in a group panic. Suddenly the weather changed and it got overcast and cooler 
and we could hear thunder rolling in. And we started to get eaten by mosquitoes and it began to rain hard. And at some point somebody started crying. And so the rest of us started crying too. I don't know how long it was, but it seemed forever that we were like that, just standing there and whimpering, the sky starting to flash with lightning. Luckily, we heard one of the moms calling her kid's name in the distance. Two of them had come out in a search party and we shouted and wailed even harder. It turned out we were pretty far away from the house and had been AWOL a full hour. And I could tell from the poor lady's face that she was generally, generally, genuinely sick with worry and about to get teary herself. When we got back inside, each of us hurtled ourselves face first into our mother's bellies, getting comforted and assured as you might think, the moms half giddy and casting off the surplus energy with lots of gentle scolding and joking. But what felt funny to me was how serious my mother was. Of course, she was relieved that we'd been found and was hugging me hard, maybe as tightly as she could. But unlike the other moms, she wasn't fixed on her child. She wasn't locked on me. For when I craned up, she was staring off into the rainy woods, her face pale. When she glanced down at me, she warmed, smiling broadly. Must my hair. But that look, I'd seen it enough before, when I caught her in repose between all her activities and chores. I couldn't know it then, but it was the look of dread, like she was seeing an infinitely unfurling emptiness. You could say, I'm just backfilling here, that I'm viewing this with a tidying retrospective lens. Probably so. I do think that if she was growing more and more intent on leaving us, it wasn't for the typical reasons. Okay, Clark couldn't have been the most exciting husband, and I wasn't the most inspiring child. And for sure, our family life was as routine and undistinguished as any other. But her disappearance wasn't the result of some dire early midlife crisis where she acted out and drank too much and began dressing like a goth teen and slept with some slick PTA dad before realizing she had better get off this track for good. There was the one notable night when they went to a neighbor's psychedelics party and she and the others ended up naked in the hot tub after Clark left for home early and she very publicly fooled around with another neighborhood woman whom she never talked to again. But that was a one-off happening they could part away and live with, even if Clark visibly grimaced whenever the words hot tub were uttered, whether in conversation or on some TV commercial. What they couldn't muster, master was my mother's mental state. As noted, Clark and I rarely talked about her. He might bring her up for no reason once a year. But he did once ask me when I was going through a rough time making any friends in a new elementary school, whether ever I, I had the feeling of blankness, especially when trying to connect with other kids. This was a half year or so after she left us. I didn't know what he was talking about, and he described it more, and I guess I finally understood and said I didn't because I didn't. In fact, my heart was always quivering and leaping and swollen with bloody wanting at the time, which evidently came off to my classmates as creepy and pathetic. And one of the popular boys dubbed me clingy, instantly dooming me to be shed by all at every instance. My mother, according to Clark, had the opposite problem. Thus, the notion of blankness. In the middle of one night, he told me a couple of years ago, she woke him in a panic and said that she had a dream that she was eating a slice of DiVincenzo's fresh clam pizza, her very favorite. And it was like nothing to her, just a mouthful of gubbiness and heat. I couldn't taste anything, she cried to him. But even worse, I couldn't imagine what it tasted like. I guess I thought she was losing, I guess she thought she was losing the ability to feel emotions even as she desperately wanted to feel them. Of course, Clark flippantly told her she was crazy, which probably wasn't the ideal word, and she went back to sleep and never again brought it up with him. As noted, I was too little to add up what, I was, what was going on with her. I was just your average, massively self-involved boy. And if I noticed anything, it was like that time I was almost lost in the woods and she embraced me too tightly, as if in doing so she could provoke the appropriate emotional response. She'd often push too hard, get us into situations that would be fun and scary, like briefly accelerating to 100 miles per hour on an empty stretch of narrow Route 111, where the speed limit was 45. We'd both be breathless and shaking, and I'd beg her to do it again, but she'd have gone completely cold and would slow way down and practically crawl us home. Was this what made her freak and cut herself out of our life? 
Maybe she really did have a kind of dementia at the tender age of 33, and like mo those much older folks, had started to grow numb and disassociate from loved ones. Or maybe it was a creeping, sinister anxiety she could see was closing in on her, but could do nothing about. Whatever it was, I have to think she suffered. She must have thought she was a horrible wife and a horrible mother, basically a horrible person not to love the people she wanted to love and was steadily gnawed away by the guilt of it, such that she had to free herself of the feeling and disappear, a final selfish act that was mostly out of her hands. It's out of our hands. Up there. Thank you, Cheng Rei. Um, I love that passage, which is sort of an ellipsis in the narrative of Tiller um, as he sort of delves into his, his past and his self. Um, I think with anyone who has had lost a parent, you know, I lost my mother when I was young. Sometimes those memories are disconnected and islanded, and yet we sort of live in the present, in the in-between those memories and how they sort of affectually um, well, affect us in the present. So thank you. Um, as a reminder to everyone, you know, that passage was from Chang Rei Li's latest novel, My Year Abroad, uh, published, by, um, published in 2021. Uh, it was released about 25 years after your first novel, Chang Rei, Native Speaker. Um, how, I just want to kick off this um, session by asking, how do you look back on Native Speaker 25 years later in light of the trajectory of your career and also in light of, you know, the landscape of American, Asian American literature? Well, uh, I don't look back on it that often, to tell you the truth. Uh, but when I, when I think about that time, it's mostly... Uh, I don't think about the publication of it or the response or everything that happened after the book came out. I, I, I always go back to when I was writing it, uh, which was in during my graduate MFA days in Eugene. Um, I started that novel for my first workshop. The first chapter was the first was my first kind of workshop experience in the program. And um and I just sort of proceeded writing it from there. But but what I had felt going into that time of my life and going to that program uh, was that I was, you know, I think for the first time in my life, um, really committed to something. <laughs> I mean, really committed to this project. Um, not because I thought it was going to be good or successful or anything like that, but that I, uh, and I've, I've talked about this a bit uh, with students and, and other and other audiences. Um, I think it was the first story that I really cared about mm -hmm. and that made me care to be someone who wrote, who worked in language, who told stories, who thought about characters. I think before that, um, you know, I'd written a, a, a different novel that was unpublished and unpublishable. I think I was more focused on taking on the mantle of a writer and and the posture of a writer mm. uh, and and thought that you know my facility with language my reading my education uh, my ambition all that would be enough to push me over into writing something decent mm. and uh, I think with native speaker um, at the time for me um, it was, I suppose, a kind of maybe one of the first honest artistic things I've ever done. I'd, I'd actually done to that point. Um, and that's to say, I guess, I put everything I had and knew and, and could muster into it uh, without worrying so much about, you know, where it would, where it would lead me. Yeah. Uh, and after that, I suppose, um, after the book came out, I was kind of surprised by how how nice the response was. Um, uh, even though I think the first big review we got, I remember my editor sending it to me and being quite unhappy about it in the New York Times, and the, like the Times Sunday book review, the review wasn't very positive. I think it was a review that, um, you know, kind of suggested that I should just stick to the family part of the story, uh, you know, maybe this, with the idea, I suppose that that's the part that I knew uh, and could and could speak to uh, with authority and authenticity. But um, 
but uh, but you know seeing it seeing it now from a distance um and and of course i i meet a lot of readers and and folks who who'd read the book in high school and college and uh and so it it, it is kind of amazing to me that it's still um being read um but but of course it's of a time mm. you know as everything is um and i see so much you know, back when it was when it came out, it was um, there was there was Asian American literature, uh, but it not not a fraction of what it, there is now in terms of uh, the voices, the variety, um, the the different modalities that people are using, and and just the absolute different worldviews that people have, um, and which I think is a a really wonderful thing. Yeah. It's one of those books for me that I wish I read when I was younger um, and giving that narrative to Asian Americans, you know, specifically for me, Korean American. Um, so I appreciate what that book has done for me and also for those who are reading it at such a young age. Um, you know, what strikes me reading Native Speaker and then reading My Year Abroad, your two protagonists in, in each novels are are strangely similar, right? You have Tiller Bardman, your latest novel, Henry Park, a Native Speaker, um, both seem to be cultural aliens, um, both seem to be kind of these liminal beings. Um, obviously, they're both uh, Asian. Well, I guess Tiller Bardman is, is ambiguously Asian, one eighth, I guess. I think that was the mm -hmm. exact quote. Um, and yet both have, you know, um, these dads, these distant dads, um, and both take on, um, come under the wing of a, of a you know, of a mentor. Um, for for better or worse um what are some of the similarities that you've intentionally put between those two characters i guess when writing my year abroad or i guess a better question would be how do those books talk to each other in light of your career well um you know when writing my year abroad i, I obviously i wasn't thinking about any other books i'd written um but you know things come to the surface you know i've always dealt with people who are deeply, I'm sorry to say, use it this way, but deeply unrooted, <laughs> which is to say they're not floating out in the universe. It's just, they want deep roots, but they don't quite have them. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I'm, I'm constantly looking for ways to, to sever ties for those, for those kinds of characters. Um, and one of the ways, of course, for me is to to remove uh, and to, to to create a void in terms of you know familial connection, uh, mm -hmm. familial uh, a familial place of you know understanding and refuge, uh, say a mother or a relationship with a father, um, and then of course you know to be culturally it's in some ways at a remove. Uh, you use the word disassociation. I think it's I think that's a good word because it, it's, you know, you have the sense that, you know, your life is going on and yet the, the, the private life, the, the emotional life, the affective life that's going on, to use your term, um, doesn't exactly have this, have an align, the, a perfect alignment with the, with the public world mm -hmm. and all the things that are going on in it. Um, and it's not just because people misunderstand you. I think I think it's that's that's maybe you know a catalyst for things. But the responses can I think are so ornate and com and complicated. Uh, mm -hmm. The ways in which we respond to that kind of you know immediately being set aside or 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 say you know being alienated. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I think um, you know those the the responses we have are so are so real and yet they're all, you know real in terms of what we do but i think in the end um they're also kind of manufactured for the ways in which we need to need to absolutely just cope in literary terms that means for me um you know just really exploring all the ways in which um you know what all the ways in which a certain kind of psyche, a certain kind of personality becomes formed and reformed and warped by all these, not just the outside world, 
saying they don't know you or they don't understand you, but your own response to that world and all the ways in which that can that can sh misshape you in in and I think very very profound ways. Yeah. Well, thank you for touching on um, segueing to the theme of, of this talk of affect. Um, you know, for myself, reading your works, you do have such an affectual touch when it comes to hybrid um, Americans um, as myself. Um, how much of that came from your own experience and, you know, how you grew up? I, I you know, I'm, I can't know for sure, but, um, but I know that because of the things that, that I return to when I'm, you know, thinking about a character, thinking about stories. And again, I'm not, you know, as a writer, of course, I'm thinking about a larger story, but, but in the end, that larger story is only informed and can only be informed by the things that give me pause, the things that give me anxiety, the things that give me trouble psychically, you know, the, the, the unanswered questions, um, you know, the, the things that are left out in terms of answers. And, and I guess, um, you know, my sense of where all those kinds of urges come, the narrative urges, character urges, are definitely things that, you know, I, I experienced growing up. Um, and not, and again, not in a ways that, that are, uh, were egregious for me in my particular case. Um, but, but they were marking. And as I said that, as I suggested before, um, I, I think I was quite early on quite conscious of my own reactions to what I was, you know, being, you know, put through, um, you know, and, and, and those reactions wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily be consistent. I think a lot of uh, minority and, and um, uh, others know this, right? You, you, sometimes your reactions are to be, you know, aggressive and rebellious. Sometimes it's to be compliant uh, and meek. Sometimes it's um, to try to be understanding sometimes and compassionate. Sometimes it's, it's to try to erase oneself. All these things to me, um, it seemed to me were, were, were part of me. Right. Um, they, 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 and, and, and that's what's shocking about it. I mean, it, it seemed like, and, and I, I'm, I'm not suggesting that this is everyone's experience, but it was definitely my own. Yeah. So the, the, my consciousness of the variety and diversity and inconsistency of all these reactions that I had just personally as a kid. Uh, as a as a you know young teenager, um, and that I still have as a grown middle aged man <laughs> sometimes, um, uh, I found to be um, a worthy ore for uh, for mining in terms of thinking about how how we put together how we put ourselves together yeah. as as citizens as people who belong or don't belong to a certain community or society. Um, and then of course, as family members. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so much of those impulses, um, at least in my case, you know, it comes later in age two of realizing, Oh, that's why I acted that way. Or that's why I felt a certain way when I was younger in certain spaces. Um, right. Yeah. And for, and for the sake of, and for the sake of fiction, of course, I, my job is to intensify those those tableaus, those inner tableaus, right? Um, and so people always ask, well, is that is that how you really felt? No, it's but but for the sake of fiction, for example, in my second novel, A Gesture Life, uh, which is about a, a a man who has to, he's he's an older man, he's looking back on his life, and he thinks about his experiences as a medical officer in a camp for the so-called comfort women. In, in in Burma, Korean comfort women. Um, to me, people sometimes will say, oh, that's a story about war and the comfort women issue. And yes, it is about those things. But for me, it was a story about the, the monstrous outgrowth that this man um, had nurtured in terms of his, his, his 
this willingness and desire and an absolute desperate need to assimilate, mm -hmm. to become, mm -hmm. you know, say, you know, to, to align with the, the, the powerful group, his Japanese side, um, and all the ways in which that absolutely deformed um, his, his, his being, his psyche, and his morality. Um, and that to me was, you know, that's, I guess, I guess a, an example of, of, you know, how I turn these feelings into, into something that, um, you know, takes narrative form. Um, but I guess, again, that intensification is, is the key for me. Yeah. Can we, can we lean into that a little more about, you know, how do you craft these, these conscious, the consciousness of your characters um, when it comes to even writing across cultures, right? In, in Doc Hata, in, in um, A Gesture Life, um, you know, in, in terms of uh, female characters in The Surrendered, um, how do you begin to craft that, you know, and in, in delving into those intensities? Well, I think it's, um, you know, it's always the same with me. And, and I think with most writers, I mean, it, I think you you start very small. I mean, it's it's really granular stuff, and I, this is something that I tell my students all the time. Um, obviously, the ones who are less experienced, and but they, you know, most students um, when they're beginning to write, even if they want to write, they rush. You know, they 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 don't understand or or trust the idea that there are. There are so many rich ideas and so many rich turns that can happen when they focus and on the small and slow down, mm -hmm. you know, and it's basically trying to keep, basically for me, it's trying to keep myself as patient as possible as a writer mm -hmm. so that when I'm writing a scene, you know, this morning I was writing a scene about a young boy making a, um, a little cabin made of Snickers bars. He loves Snickers bars and he makes a cabin out of them because he's going to a camp and he's excited. And, um, and the very details of, of all that, I mean, obviously, you know, you have to decide how the, the, the extent to which you're going to describe everything, but, but you're looking at that whole little scene and that whole little moment and looking for any angle that might in some ways reflect a bit of consciousness, hmm. right? Um, whether that's the smell that he can try to extract through the wrapper, whether it's the, the 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 toy soldiers he's putting inside of it, whether it's the shape of the of the cabin. I mean, in the in the scheme of the novel, it's a tiny tiny thing, but but I I feel as if if I focus on that and really really try to X-ray every little part of it. Not that everyone, everything will stay in there in final revision, but, but maybe I'll be able to extract some little notations, both about the world of the thing and more, more importantly, the world of, the, world of his psyche that, that you know, are just a little bit thrilling, mm -hmm. just a little bit special. Um, that, and, that, and of course, you know, they're thrilling and special because they speak some small truth about that moment. And for what he's looking forward to, and for and for who he is, yeah. um, so I think that's I think that's, you know, for me it's just this, the basic thing. I mean, it's just uh, it's the way that that writing proceeds. Um, and I know that you know we all have different modalities and and different kinds of inspiration, um, but maybe because of the writer, the kind of writer I am, and the the kinds of writing I like to do. Um, uh, for me, it's always been, I suppose, a psychological question mm -hmm. and, and deep down, um, I'm always curious about why people are doing anything in that particular moment mm -hmm. and trying to trace that. And I think if I trace that well enough, then maybe it, uh, it, uh, you know, in the end, there's a conglomeration that, that feels like a person. Yeah. who lives in the world, who belongs in that world, and who's trying to, you know, who's wrestling with it, with, with that world. Yeah. And that process can take, 
years right and... yeah well that's why <laughs> i think that's why it's not a recommended process if <laughs> you want to write quickly um I, uh, it takes me a long time to write novels yeah. um even short ones and because it it, it i think and, and this is the other thing that you one learns or at least i learned from say s focusing so much of my energy on that one scene is that it will then unlock other ideas about this character and where they've been in a way that I don't know that I could have found otherwise. I certainly couldn't have planned it out. I certainly couldn't depend on an outline mm -hmm. um, about a certain kind of character arc as mm -hmm. you know you might do in television writing. Um, because it's really about, and ultimately, of course, for me, um, and I think for most writers, it's about the nature of the language and the nature of that prose, about how that that's that's presented. Um, it's in the it's actually not just what we see, but how and, and how we see it and how it sounds to us, and that's the nature of it. Um, you know, I was just reading rereading um, Bartleby by Herman Melville, and you know, it's a, it's a great and funny, absurd story. Um, you know, it's famously the story about a scrivener, a copyist, who in this this the narrator's office who just refuses. He prefers not to do what he's asked to do, and um, and it's a perfect story because it 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 does exactly that. It 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 gives us situations that just give us little tiny facets, different little ones, of how. This this strange creature of a fellow who's refusing to do everything is starting to infect, affect, and infect the narrator. Mm -hmm. um, so really, it's a story about right about this this consciousness that's being shifted and 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 pressured and and suddenly taking on new form and new shape right, right before our eyes. You know, this character is being we think we know who this character is who's narrating the book, but now but in but in the end, he's being created moment by moment by moment, uh, through action and through his language. Yeah. Yeah, you know, on the topic of consciousness, you know, I had a writing teacher once tell me, you know, who is my teacher was African American. He said, if if you want to write about race, don't write about race. And what he meant by that was, you know, to write it in the subtext. And especially it depends on who your audience is. Um, and I think that's what he was getting at in terms of, you know, not wanting to be so didactic about it. But in terms of shading in those affective spaces, in terms of your consciousness, in terms of showing, you know, how um, displacement by ways of race or culture or, you know, whether it's gender or sexuality, whatever it may be, how all of this affects you and all of this sort of, and I love that you use the word infects your decisions and sort of the subtext of your mind, um, which, you know, you, you articulated so well and which I see in your work um, time and again in your novels. So that's definitely something that, you know, as a writer, I often keep in mind as well. Um, you teach a class at Stanford called um, Asian American Biography. Autobiography. Autobiography. Yeah. Um, and I, I imagine, you know, in the course of a semester or two semesters, you know, there's only so much you can usher the students into, you know, writing about the self. What are some takeaways that you leave with your students at the end of the year? Well, it's really more what they leave with me. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I, because they, I think, I think we're all surprised about the range um, and focus of their work, you know, it's not just all, you know, struggle family stories and, um, you know, about kids who are, you know, misunderstood both inside and outside the home and then, uh, and then are trying to find some, some measure of sucker or, um, or calm, you know, it's, we get those stories, but but um, but I think what what we all find as as participants in that workshop is that um, you know these we have so many different kinds of stories that they it, that if looked at in some 
it's very hard to say anything about them that's definitive. <laughs> and that's one of the great things I think about the class for me. Uh, is what, what I take away each semester. Um, I'm kind of exhilarated by how much variety there is and that how, how little I know about the Asian American experience. Mm -hmm. And that's and that's something that, yes, that we have certain things in common that we can talk about. We have certain because many of us are immigrants or many of us uh, have a language issue in the home or many of us, um, you know, we 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 are integrated in society in certain ways in other ways we will never be because of the way we look. So we have certain kinds of commonalities. But again, the ways in which stories are told about those 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 issues or subjects um, seem to me infinitely you know different and uh, and I think that's something that you know you know in all these in in certain classes you think okay it's Asian American autobiography so we're going to have a certain kinds of ideas about hybrid life we're going to have certain ideas about you know um, migrancy or immigrancy we're gonna and 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 what i love about the class is that um all those things get kind of exploded pretty mm -hmm. quickly uh because of the way because precisely because of the way people write mm -hmm. uh, and and they write in all different ways and again that's that's the way that some 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 of the students have uh you know a, a voice that's informed and uh, drawn from poetry. Others are very essayistic and um, almost, you know, like like uh, advocacy pieces, uh, as you would have in an op-ed. Others are just plain like fiction writer storytellers. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, the, so the, it's I love the spectrum of it, um, and I love the plenitude of it. And, yeah. and I think that's what I think. You know, in some ways, that's what we're all hoping for, right? <laughs> we're not, I mean, we, we have commonality, but, and, and we can speak about all the things that we've been talking about, but in terms of, you know, things we have trouble with, mm -hmm. um, but our reactions to it, our human reactions to it, mm -hmm. not necessarily our Asian American reactions to it, mm -hmm. are so varied that that also becomes part of the Asian American experience the asian american psyche if anyone can say that right. um, and again and, and again that's also historical you know things change over time the, the the kinds of writing that we would have in this class if it were somehow magically transported back to 1920 would be very different mm -hmm. right than it is now and it'll be very different 100 years from now um, so i remind them of that too you could, we can only speak about our time um, and because that's the only thing we're informed by. Yeah. Yeah, so much, so many possibilities when it comes to the diversity and narratives, but also with, you know, genre bending, genre queering, and, you know, that makes it possible for a lot of different perspectives um, to be published. Well, um, and I think, and I think a lot of the students appreciate that because I think they do feel sometimes constrained by, you know the expectations of certain kinds of narratives right. and and you know be they want they don't want to to just perform those things mm -hmm. because they feel like that's the way that they're going to be noticed or that's the way they're going to be valued or that's the way they're going to be sometimes they feel they're going to be evaluated because of the, in those ways and mm -hmm. and i think just seeing and hearing the the range of responses and the range of output from the from all these different class members i think that is in itself is freeing and liberating yeah absolutely. um i would love to open up um the conversation to any questions that the audience might have but um while we wait for questions to come in um i'd love to ask you in in light of genre you know i understand you're working on a novel Currently, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't like to talk about it, but, much, but uh, it's a novel that's um, more autobiographically based than any other uh, of my other novels. I mean, my other novels are not autobiographically based really at all. 
I mean, my year abroad was set in a town that was like Princeton, New Jersey, where I lived for a long time, but that's about it. Um, but this particular novel is uh, focuses on a young a young character who uh, Korean American boy grows up in the suburbs of New York City in the 1970s, and which is really my life. Mm. And but of course, fictionalized, you know, um, his his story and uh, his trajectory uh, for for its own purposes. What is your, you know, you, you also write essays and also short fiction. Um, what is your perspective on fiction and its 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 utility or its its presence in our culture today? Like, what is what does fiction mean to you in, in the marketplace today? Well, you know, I, I think it, I think it's, I think it's under attack in many ways. <laughs> I think people, uh, I think a lot of readers or the public, um, I think more and more people are looking at other things like, you know, streaming shows and, um, and other kinds of media um, and, and maybe people aren't growing up with fiction in the same way that I grew up with fiction. You know, that, that fiction was a place and is a place for me where, um, you know, again, just reading one, any particular story I've mentioned, Bartleby or any other kind of novel or, or short story, you learn so much about so many things all at once. <laughs> and, and it's, not just about writing, not just about the way narrative works, but about place, time, characters, and again, the the varieties of human experience. And and I think that people have forgotten that about fiction. Yeah. Uh, and and maybe I hope are rediscovering it because you know practitioners like yourself, we we we're constantly trying to get people to read more. Mm -hmm. um, but it's so much harder. I think we all know that. You know, people people don't want to sit down and read for more than a five minute thing <laughs> you know, on the phone. Uh, and I know my students read read books on their phones. Um, but yeah, how could you really read a whole 500 page novel on your phone? I just don't know how it works. <laughs> so so I, so I, I think that I think for people who, who who read fiction and love fiction, they know how important and great it is for, for, for a variety of reasons. Mm -hmm. um, my worry is how do we get, how do we get people, new readers to understand that? Mm -hmm. um, be, because what their, what the, their alternatives that they have are, are so efficient in certain, in, in, in ways, right. And, and sensational and, and, you know, they, they stimulate very quickly um and and that's that's very hard to compete against yeah uh we have a question here that um touches on how you pay attention to the small moments in in sketching a character's consciousness um does that have a parallel to any kind of mindfulness or awareness practice in your daily life well that's a good question i i don't have a practice like that but i think um at, at least a formal practice like that i think that ever since I was a little kid, um, basically, I don't know, maybe they call that attention deficit disorder, <laughs> but I, I think that's been my practice in a certain way where I'm, uh, I'm, I'm constantly somewhere else at any given time. And, and I don't know if that's something that is natural to me or that it was a, you know, somewhat a defense mechanism or some kind of, but it's something that I'm, that I've always had, which is just, I'm, I'm constantly noodling about just whatever trivial or important thing it doesn't really matter. And even though I'm, you know, kind of having a conversation, I mean, and sometimes even, you know, when I'm doing something, I'll, I'll, con you know, I'll constantly have something else. And, and I think that, that kind of um it's not sometimes you know the greatest thing but um but i feel as if uh, that's helped me um to to do to do those things i mentioned to slow down um 
and and to really kind of quietly obsess about things yeah um in in a very measured way and i think right. that's and i think that's i think that's always a good thing for a writer yeah i would agree um another question we have here is um someone was moved by the scene of your characters crying and one started crying and then another when you write what are the ways you access those precious moments without falling apart yourself <laughs> well you know sometimes you i think we all know this as writers sometimes you'll write something and you'll feel something you know uh, i know that sometimes i don't know whether it's going to be end up to be good prose and a, and a good scene or a good chapter but i do know that i'm hitting upon something when i have a kind of physical reaction sometimes i actually start to sweat sometimes um i feel a little sick and and i think that's when you know i, I mentioned this sometimes to my students i think that's sometimes a, a good signal to you to keep on going you know, something, you know, it, that this uncomfortable physical feeling that you might have um, when you're writing a certain scene, writing a certain character, having someone say something, you know, that's, that's, you know, unsavory or dangerous or unlikely or even absurd. If I think, you know, there's something about trusting the body as a writer that, that I've learned to do over the years yeah. you know it, when i first started writing i had that feeling and i'd be like oh i, I, I gotta stop because it's uncomfortable it's but in fact um that married with just even more thought about why and and more interrogation about why i'm feeling that way why this scene and the way that it's playing out um is essentially disturbing me right. um that I think is a great moment and a potentially, you know, really fruitful moment uh, for a writer. How do you navigate that with, you know, with students? I, I'm, I'm curious about in, in light of mental health, in light of where a student or a writer may be um, with not having support around them. How do you, and they, they still want to write about it. How do you navigate those situations where you're turning personal experience and a very painful personal experience into art? Well, I try to always remind them that um, whatever they're writing is not them. It's not their life. It's it's a presentation. It's a it's an orchestration. It's a it's a work that is um, necessarily you know split from them and. And I think that's the only way they can really do it, yeah. especially when you're writing about stuff that's really heavy. And, and sometimes my, my students do write about stuff that's really heavy um, and just stuff that, you know, nobody, you know, it's, it's so hard to even deal with. But the fact that they're trying to write about it suggests to me and I think suggests to them that they're maybe ready to start writing about it. Mm -hmm. But that, but then the next step, I think, is to try to speak of it as out there, to try to think of oneself as a character, mm -hmm. rather than, you know, the 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 only um, the 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 only respondent and vessel for all this stuff, mm -hmm. um, and because it is too hard, it is much too hard. But those, but but if you can if you can have those things simultaneously. That the sense of the sense of that injury, the sense of that this that unsettling feeling, but then put it out there, that that can be very powerful. And also, of course, to remember that we're writing stories, and 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 that the person reading your story is not reading about you. It's reading a, reading you. It's reading about you, which is different. It's achieving that narrative and critical distance of your own life, even. Yeah. 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 Um, on a lighter tone, what do you do when you get stuck writing a scene? Uh, well, I get stuck all the time. Uh, <laughs> I, um, uh, I get up, I, uh, and people, are, you know, I think people are surprised that, you know, I feel like I have writer's block every single day <laughs> and pretty much most moments. 
So I'm constantly, um, I'm constantly just trying to, to restart. And, and whether that means, you know, making lunch, making dinner, whether that means taking a quick walk, whether that means uh, rereading stuff over and over again, um, it's just all different kinds of strategies and tactics. But um, it, I think it, it's, it's just really important to, um, to not, to not um, stay in a rut of thinking about that thing. Because if you do, then you can just spiral down into that cave and and that cave is very deep and you'll never get out. <laughs> you know, it's it's and that's my it's maybe it's just motion. You know, I you know, I tell my I tell my students, you know, you just have to be like a shark. You know, sharks die if they don't keep swaying. Mm. They need they need it just to keep the you know, to keep keep the keep the water keep themselves oxygenated and 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 i feel the same way and don't be distracted by bait yeah. <laughs> uh, we have a few minutes left um i guess I'd, I'd love to end with a question of what is a piece of advice you would give yourself starting out all those years ago mm. uh I, I guess I guess it maybe goes back to what I first said about when you asked me about native speaker, and um, I guess it would be uh, don't write about anything that you don't really care about. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you can't. I, th I think in the end, you can't manufacture that. You can't manufacture passion. You can't manufacture care for a subject or or a character or a time in history or you know, and and it because it shows. Mm. And and the better the writer you are, technically, um, it won't help you. All right. And so, so it I think it it really behooves you to. Um, to be honest about that, to be honest about what you really need to write about and, and how you want to write about it. Not let anyone tell you how to write about it, yeah. uh, but just but just do it that way. Yeah. Um, I don't know whether that will work out, but, but I don't think any other way will work out if you don't care. Right. Yeah. Cheng Ray, we're just about out of time, but um, thank you so much for spending time with us um, and having this conversation. Uh, it means a lot to me, and I know it means a lot to our audience out there and for Pacific MFA, and so um, much appreciated. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Michael. Your questions are great, and uh, thanks for everyone for uh, tuning in. And thanks, everyone, for showing up tonight. We'll see you soon. Okay. Bye. Thanks, Scott. <laughs> thanks, Scott.